Hey guys, it's Biggs. Now welcome back. Now, you guys know my love for isopods. Got lots of them. We got making space for more in the room. But honestly, with my background, my science backgrounds and stuff, I begin to think that I wonder if we're actually keeping them wrong. Before you start criticizing me right away, let's watch the video. Let's get into it a little bit deeper and let's start the conversation. Maybe we could do better. you as fascinated as I am by the incredible diversity of life that surrounds us? Well, if you are, then you definitely belong here with me. I make videos on all facets of nature, from aquariums and vivariums, reptiles, isopods, insects and arachnids, all sorts of unique plants, and many DIY projects. One thing I try to do is I try to dig a little bit deeper into the science behind it all. So if you haven't already, please consider hitting that subscribe button as well as ringing that little notification bell and you'll always be kept up to date when I upload new content. As you guys have seen many times over in many of my videos, this is one of my cultures. This happens just happens to be my culture of Brasilio Hoffman Segai. And it's pretty standard for the way that I keep most of my isopods. And it's pretty standard for the way most people keep isopods. You know, I'm using these, uh, these are what the, the animals have come home in. And this is basically virgin, uh, it's basically cellulose. It's virgin uh, egg cartons, but they use it as a form of cellulose. Do I need this? Definitely not. But because Hoffman Sagai is a large species, the males can often get a little bit territorial, a little bit more aggressive. So they do offer a little bit more visual structure or barriers or walls per se, to allow the, the animals to have a bit more distance from each other should they need it. But other than that, if you take those out of the equation, we basically have got cork pieces, bark pieces, and then a simulated, what I'm gonna call a forest floor with leaf litter. Now our soil and our substrate mixes, you guys have, we've talked about that in other videos, and there's many, many different forms that people use, but we want a nice organic, loamy soil compost that you'd find on the bottom of a forest floor. So I use things like uh, sea soil or worm castings or a nice good organic potting mix. We use leaves of different types of plants uh, that we find in the fall. I like to clean mine just because I don't want to risk the introduction. Whether you do or not, that's up to you. But uh, for me, for my purposes, I collect leaves in the fall and then I go and uh, I bake them all in the oven for a brief period of time to make sure I'm just not introducing anything else. Offering cuddle bone, as you see there, lots of cuddle bone. I put calcium carbonate, which is a granular product. It's a product that's used in the reptile trade as a substrate for, uh, for certain animals. Uh, it's a readily available calcium source. I put that in the mix as well. I also, because we have a farm, we get lots and lots of eggs. I save all the eggshells and I crush them up. So there's always a readily available sources of calcium. And then on the other side, on this one being a porcilio, which likes it a bit drier, so you get an idea of the whole enclosure. This is the dry, tons and tons of ventilation. You know, cross ventilation, good ventilation. There's also on the lid, there's also holes on the perimeter of the lid as well. And then on the edge, on this side, this is the moist side, and you can see they're all throughout it as well. I want to try and be as delicate as I can with them, but uh, this is their moisture sink because isopods, the order isopoda, they're anthropods, and they're basically all another form of crustacean. They're a terrestrial crustacean, uh, so they're more closely allied with things like shrimp. They do not breathe through lungs, they breathe through more like a primitive gill system. So they do need a, a good moisture retentive area that they can go to should they need. Here's another example of an enclosure. You'll also see there's uh, pieces of charcoal that have been added. Uh, charcoal is a good sweetener. It also, you know, breaks it up, breaks up, the, makes the, the media nice and loose. I've used things like fir bark, cypress bark, but I can also tell by the addition of that charcoal, that means probably when I added the springtails to the culture, which is another thing we're going to talk about, is the microfauna that we use and establish a culture. Now this culture, you know, as I say, is similar. This one here happens to be my Japan line of uh, Armadillidium vulgari. And this is the one known as Magic Potion, where it gets all those unique little colorations through their translucent shell. And they are doing very, very well. 
armadilidiums, as you guys have seen in other videos, they seem to be better uh, decomposers. They break down a lot more leaf litter and leaf matter and wood matter than would say some of the Porcilios. But bottom line is, I think that we're taking the care. I've watched, I've done a bunch of videos. I've seen a bunch of videos. This is not intended in any way a slight on anybody in the way that they care for their isopods. I'm just starting to question whether or not there's certain aspects of things that we can do better. Maybe there's ways we can maximize things. I don't know. It's mainly just as a point of starting the conversation. But I think some of us are taking their care a little bit far too serious and perhaps too clinical. These animals are detrivores. And a detrivore, they're going to break down all that stuff that they're going to find on the forest floor. They're going to break down leaf litter, mosses, decaying wood matter. They're going to break down animals that have, have passed away. Bone matter, where they'll get their calcium sources, as well as other things within the soil. Look what they've done to their cuddle bone. There's almost nothing left there. Again, moist side, drier side. You guys have seen. It may not look like there's lots in here, but this is a really a thriving colony of Porcilio Lavis orange. You can see all the babies just writhing through there in the, the substrate. Don't want to disturb them too much. But they are, I, th I think some of us keep them a little bit too clinical, as I mentioned. And these animals really are pretty straightforward organisms. I think the, the process when we talk about people, this, this species is more challenging than this species, or that species is more challenging than that one because of this or that. I think it comes down to not the animals, it's us understanding how to properly set up the animals for their best care. And I'm basically, I'm going to revert it back to thinking about the way that I keep an aquarium. Now, most people would probably argue or think that an aquarium is a beautiful piece of nature in their home. But honestly, that's not correct. This will never be a natural system. This will never be truly balanced like a natural system. There will always be the struggle. We will always have to help it and maintain it. But if we look at it in the same sort of aspects in the way that we keep isopods, we want to maintain it as a natural system as best that we can. And what that means with an aquarium, you set up an aquarium, you add water, and then after you've added water, you add some life. And that is in the form of either adding some fish, which are going to produce some waste products, or by adding inoculating it with some bacterial strains to get life started within that system. And as it matures, the bacteria and so forth will establish, colonize, and they will break down most of the waste products that the animals, the other higher animals, like the fish and the plants and stuff, and the other things that go into the tank, any organic matter, they'll break that product down, uh, and then we maintain it by doing water changes, partial water changes, and maintaining the environment. Well, the idea is the same for, for the isopods. Maybe we should be setting them up as a, as a brand new container and not setting up and, and setting it up sterile and just throwing some potty medium and, and throwing the isopods in right. Maybe we should be establishing or culturing that, that environment first with some microfauna, perhaps like springtails and other you know, different types of bacteria and so forth and get that environment really truly established. And all the little parameters of uh, the amount of ventilation, the amount of moisture and those type of factors figured out before we actually add the isopods. I don't know, food for thought. But bottom line is we also all know and we can all probably agree is that isopods are extremely resilient creatures. But if we were to go to that process of establishing that natural biological cycle, once we do add the isopods, uh, I think it'll be a much more easier transition and that will greatly probably reduce a lot of those immediate dies off, the transition dies off that people often refer to or talk about when they bring home a new culture. We hear people talk about isopods relate to different types of uh, elevations and different types of pH and chemistry within the soil. And those things are all factors that all have merit as well. This is my daughter's dairy cow culture. And, you know, everyone will agree that this is a species that, you know, can thrive for pretty much anyone. And you could literally ignore this for a while. As long as they've got moisture and they've got leaf litter and food, they will thrive. They're an easy one. So why would Priscilio Lavis dairy cow, for example, thrive, whereas 
say, most of the Kubara species then when they come in for people, newly acquired Kubaras. And let's put it all, let's compare apples to apples. Let's say that both species we're talking about are both 100% captive bred. And maybe even both, let's just put it on, a, on an even playing field even more and say they both came from the same source. But the Kubaras would be much slower to establish than would be the dairy cows. And why is that? Well, honestly, it comes down to is the care. You'll notice almost everybody that keeps isopods will keep them almost identical. They'll keep them right across the board identical in the same way. They'll figure out some will need a bit more moisture, some will need a bit more air, but otherwise they all keep them in the same sort of containers, you know, varying sizes and so forth. We feed them both of the same things. We'll notice that Porcilios like a little bit more protein than perhaps say Armadillidium. Kubaras like it a little wetter. Kubaras also perhaps like it a little warmer. But if it's an animal that comes directly from a limestone cave, it would never see any leaf litter within that cave. It would see bat guano. So maybe we want to revise that and look at the way we're keeping that one. I don't know. I'm not saying that's the way I want to change it. I'm not expecting anyone to change. If it's working, it's working. This is not, this is not an exact science. We're experimenting. We're having some fun. Join me next week for part two, where we're going to dig a little bit deeper into this topic. The only way we're all going to get better is by learning from each other. So thank you, my friends. Till next time, take care.